And, and so sometimes people are, are close to us that we're not blood kin, if you will. But if they betray us, if they turn against us and let us down, it can be very, very difficult. The people that are closest to us, um, especially family members, the betrayal in this scenario is family. It's blood, it's kin, uh, but th that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, the Bible tells us that there is such a thing as a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And, and so sometimes people are, are close to us that we're not blood kin, if you will, but if they betray us, if they turn against us and let us down, it can be very, very difficult. And in this chapter, 2 Samuel 15, David is betrayed by his own son, Absalom. Now, we tried to set the table, especially last, last week together. Uh, the storm clouds, as it were, have been brewing. Uh, going all the way back uh, a few chapters earlier, Absalom killed who? Amnon, his own half-brother, because now I'm not saying, I'm not addressing whether or not Amnon deserved killing. I'm not addressing that. Uh, but he had raped Absalom's sister, Tamar. And, and ultimately, Absalom had him killed. And that, that was just a further splintering of David's royal family. And, and from that time onward, the storm clouds have have been slowly brewing, maybe not as perceptible at some times as at others, but uh, now tonight in this chapter, everything is about to blow, as we might say, wide open. So look at chapter 15 and verse 1, and after this it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. The first two words in the New King James Version are after this. After this what? what? What did we end chapter 14 with last week? What's happened publicly? Okay, Absalom, and another R word, Mike, I would use maybe even as the word restoration. Absalom has been restored to court life and if he's been restored to court life as the king's son, he's also been restored to public life. And we touched on that last week. This was a piece that had to be in place, uh, whether you describe it as having fallen in place or whether you describe it as being put in place. This piece had to be in place for Absalom's coup or for Absalom's rebellion to really have a chance and to take off. He had to be restored to public life. And you're going to see why now in the verses that follow. Here in verse one, he's prepared chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now, our transportation today is not as it was in ancient times, but how do we know today that a VIP, a very very important person has come to town. How do we know that today? Okay, there's an entourage. Somebody used the word entourage. Somebody mentioned the cars. Um, I was coming back from Atlanta earlier this, uh, no, this weekend. I was driving back, and at one of the exits just outside, like in the Douglasville area, there were cars and cop cars and unmarked cars everywhere. And as far as we could tell, I don't think I don't think there had been a wreck. I, I don't think there had been an accident, but it was almost like you had a VIP or a dignitary, perhaps. I'm just guessing here. I really don't know. But it's almost as if you had one in town that had gotten off at that exit and was waiting for the next move or something like that. Um, they they didn't have uh, Escalades and they didn't have uh, armor plated vehicles and things like that in David's day. But they did have chariots, and they had horses, and they had men. And can you imagine the spectacle anytime you're moving across town or, or you're moving in the public eye, 50 people, 50 men running out ahead of you as if to clear the way for you. You know, Absalom's coming, Absalom's coming, perhaps. 
Uh, after we dismiss our young people, uh, we have over 50 in here tonight, but, but not many left in the auditorium. And so imagine a group about this size, all men running ahead of Absalom. And so he's done this, he's contrived this to give the impression that he is an important person and, and no doubt is going to work. Verse 2, now Absalom would rise early. He would get up early. We say the early bird gets the what? Okay, what does that imply? Why does the early bird get the worm? Okay, he, he, he beats everybody else. Okay, that's it. Absalom would rise early to get ahead of, uh, of anybody else, or the idea probably is to just be in position so that he can intercept these people. He can catch these people who are perhaps making their way to the palace. They're making their way to see David, but he's going to be there in place first so that he can intercept them. And he would stand beside the way to the gate. So it was, whenever anyone who had a lawsuit, now I'm reading from the New King James Version, anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision, that Absalom would call to him and say, what city are you from? And he, I believe the, the person, whoever the person would be, the person would say, your servant is from such a such, such and such a tribe of Israel. In other words, the narrator is just, you know, generically telling us what would happen. Absalom was up early. He was in the proper place. Somebody would be coming to meet with the king. Absalom would catch him. Hey, friend, where are you from? Well, I'm, I'm from the tribe of, of Naphtali, or, or I'm from the tribe of, of Gad, or I'm from the tribe of Manasseh, or whatever. And then notice what would happen. Verse 3, then Absalom would say to him, look. And what's implied here is obviously this person also tells Absalom what? His case. That's implied. But, but, but having heard the case, Absalom would say to him, look. Your case is good and right. I see where you're coming from. And I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, you know what? I believe you're right. I, I would, if I were king, if I were choosing or settling these matters, I would choose your side. Your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Now, if David is tasked with adjudicating all of these cases himself for an entire nation, do you imagine that perhaps a lot of people would come to see the king that maybe never got to see David? Okay, How do you feel if you get up early one morning and, and you travel? Let's say you get up early and you want, uh, you've got an appointment, you think, to go to Birmingham and to have a doctor's appointment, and you get up early and you fight Birmingham traffic and you make it downtown to UAB, and you go in, and the receptionist says, oh, we were supposed to call you, uh, but we're so sorry. Dr. So-and-so is, is booked full today, and, and there's just no way he's going to be able to see you. How are you going to feel? Mad. <laughs> now, Gwen, I, I, don't, I can't see you ever getting mad about that, Gwen. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to be mad. We're going to be disappointed. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then their, their emotions are already primed to, to, to feel what way toward Absalom when he says, man, I, I, I like your case. I, I believe you're right. You're already primed to be what? To like Absalom. Because you're mad at whom? You're probably mad at David. You know, because you've traveled all this way and, and, and David either can't see you or perhaps maybe David sees you and he rules against you. That could happen sometimes. He says, your case is good and right, but there's just no deputy of the king to hear you. Here I am, you know, I'm the king's son, perhaps at this time, maybe even the crown prince, now that he's knocked off Amnon, I, I, we're not sure. Uh, boy, if I were just in the position, if, if, if dad would just deputize me and would just let me help out with this caseload, I tell you what, I would agree with you. I think you've got a good and right case, and, and I would help you out. And, and that would be music to people's ears, and he's telling them that. Verse 4.
Well, you know, that may be implied. Yeah, in other words, he, he could be uh, subtly calling into question dad's administrative skills, you know. Dad should have other deputies, you know, that can help him with this. And uh, I, I wished I were. Look at verse 4. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that I were made judge in the land. If dad would just deputize me, I could help him out. And everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me, then I would give him what? Okay. So the implication is, just reading the text in a straightforward manner right here, this context, the implication is, is that perhaps David has got too much uh, too much responsibility on himself to the point that he he's having a hard time maybe getting around to everybody. If that's the case, is there any other biblical character we read about earlier in the Old Testament that was given some similar advice? Moses, that's right. Going all the way back, I, I think it's to Numbers, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but definitely in the Pentateuch, going all the way back to the time of Moses. And who comes to Moses and gives him this much needed advice that basically you need to set up men under you that can adjudicate these smaller matters so that the only things that come to your table are big issues. And you can get to the big issues if you're not bogged down with everything else. Who, who gave Moses that advice? His father-in-law, Jethro. Okay. Jethro's a cool name, right? Uh, his father-in-law, Jethro, gives him that advice. And so that, that seems to be maybe something akin to what we may be uh, seeing here with David and how Absalom is trying to manipulate the hearts of the people. He's placing his dad in a bad light in order to uh, gain points, of course, with the people. By the way, if you've got a legitimate suit or a legitimate case and you really are being wronged, but the, the judge, in this case, King David, if he cannot get around to you, what are you not getting? You're not getting justice. You're just not getting. It's not on the merits of your case. On the merits of your case, you would deserve justice, perhaps. But because of whatever reason, David's too busy or what whatnot, you're not getting justice. Mark this at the end of verse four. What Absalom is promising is, he says, then I would give him justice. Oh, if dad would just make me a judge. Well, uh, Perhaps you would have to be uh, living under a rock in the palace, right? Not to be, not to be. We, we talked about that going all the way back to uh, chapter 11, but, but maybe so. Maybe that's in the back of Absalom's mind, his dad's failures. And, uh, but I don't know that that's necessary, Mike. I, I think what he sees here, I think Absalom is very opportunistic. He, he sees a potential problem maybe with the caseload, and he, he's, he's, what's the word, exploiting. He's exploiting that, taking advantage of that, and then all the while, if he has his daddy's other failures in the back of his mind all the while, then that's just fueling this fire. Yes. Yeah, right. Now, wait a minute, CJ. Are you implying that that politicians will tell people what they want to hear even if it's not correct? Okay, no, no. Not, not American politicians, but in history, politicians uh, we see here might tell people what they want to hear even if it's not correct. And I did wonder about that. I, that. That thought kind of went through my mind. There's no indication that Absalom has any access to the uh, defendant in this case. You know, He just hears one side of the story, and, and the proverb we looked at Sunday afternoon, uh, when you hear one side of the story, you think what? 
Hey, that, that's side drive. That's side drive. Brother, uh, I think it was Guy in Woods. Was it Guy in Woods? No, Guy in Woods was a student. So it was somebody before his day, maybe Brother Hardeman or somebody. But uh, Brother, Wood, Brother Woods, as I recall, was wanting to study the book of Revelation. And uh, he went to one of the esteemed professors back in the day. This was at Freed Hardeman College, if I remember correctly. And he went to one of the esteemed professors and said, Brother so-and-so, I'm, I'm wanting to learn more about Revelation. And he says, Brother Woods, take this book. He got him a book. He says, you read this book and, and uh, come back and tell me what you think. And uh, Brother Woods, having the intellectual appetite that he had, he, uh, I think he read that book in one night. He went in that night. And he read that book, and he said, you know what? It just cleared up everything. It just cleared up everything for me, just as clear as day. And uh, he, I went back to Brother So-and-So. I brought the book back the next day. And he says, uh, thank you so much. You know, this has answered my questions. This is all I, I could ever ask to know. And Brother So-and-So said, wait a minute. He said, wait a minute. Let me give you this book. He says, now you need to read this book, too. And so Brother Woods <laughs> took that book. And he read it probably in a, in a night or in a sitting, knowing Brother Woods. And he says, everything I thought I knew the first time on Revelation, he said, after I read this book, he says, I knew all that was wrong, you know. And, uh, and it just goes to say that when, when there are multiple sides, then so you need to hear both sides before you make an, a decision. Political pandering, that's a good word. And you also used another word that, that brings up an interesting scenario, preemptively. Let's say that you're one of these uh, people coming to the king for justice, and on the way in, the king's son tells you, hey, you've got a good case. If I were judge, I'd choose you. And then what if you went in and appeared before David, and David did the exact opposite? How would you feel then coming out? You would feel equal, I mean, not equally, you would feel increasingly abused because you knew going in that the king's son said, hey, this is a winner. You've got a winner. So that, that would also cause an interesting scenario there to unfold. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a great connection. Yes, it's a very good connection. And that ties in with Mike's earlier comments, too, about what things are in the back of Absalom's mind regarding the deficiencies of his father. Yeah, how do you betray? And and then bringing it that turn, Mike, that really puts the onus on us today because every child of God, every Christian member of the church, whoever falls away and turns his or her back on Jesus, 
you need to think about Absalom. And the reason I say that is because, as you mentioned, David brought him back home. The, the last line, I noticed that this afternoon, the last sentence in, verse, in chapter 14 is, then the king what? He kissed him. So, I mean, here, here Absalom is, he's fully restored, he's forgiven by the father, David, and now that makes Absalom's treachery even worse. And so when we make this application to us, as members of the Lord's body, God forbid, but if we turn away, we're doing what Absalom did and more. Because God has really forgiven you. He's really forgiven me. He's really welcomed us back into fellowship with him. And if we turn our backs on the Lord, our treachery is, is even worse than Absalom's. And, and I don't know that I had thought of it quite that way, but, but that comes to mind with these good comments. That's exactly right. It did not, it did not end well with Absalom, and it will not end well with us. If we, uh, and it goes back, Tony, we can go even further to when he betrayed one of his right hand men. You're right. You know, that, th these are good points. He, mm. In other words, you see a selfish, yeah. Well, there, there is no doubt, there is no doubt that in all of that, that fiasco with Bathsheba and Uriah, that selfishness is going to see. I mean, that's just all that is. And um, hmm, that gives you a lot to think about, Tony, a lot to think about. Hmm. Going back to the woman of Tekoa, yeah. Yeah. That adds another layer to it, doesn't it? And and I wondered, Casty, you know, remember now when he was banished, that was three years. So that's three years' time. That if his heart is bent in this direction, what are the wheels able to do in his mind for three years? They're able to turn, and then then he comes up home. He potentially finds out how he got back home. He, he he finds out all these other things. Perhaps yeah. There's a lot here. Remember the way we opened it up. The storm clouds have been what? They've been gathering. They've been brewing for a while, and it it's just not going to be pretty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To the grave. Yes, absolutely. All the way back to Second Samuel eleven, at least. All right, excellent thoughts, excellent thoughts. Now look, he, we're not through reading about his pandering here. Look at verse five. And so it was whenever anyone came near to bow down to him. Now, if, if you're a citizen and you're approaching the palace and lo and behold, here's the prince, Absalom, standing there. What, what does decorum call for? You bow down. Okay, that, that's decorum. That, that shows proper respect and reverence. For, for this royal leader, but it so it goes that whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. And now that Brad used the word pandering, which is very appropriate in this context. How would that make you feel? You're a nobody. You're you're just a a, a citizen of the state, and, and you go to show the proper deference and the proper respect to the ruler. And he grabs your hand and says, oh, no, come on up here and give me a hug. How's that going to make you feel? 
It'll make you feel important. Make you feel good. Okay, man, you're liking. So he he gives you a hug. He kisses you. He tells you that your case is right. He wishes that he were judge. He would judge in your favor. And let's say you get in and you get to see David, and David rules against you. Boy, how many points is that for Absalom? Absalom one hundred, David zero. You know, it, it's a it's a it's a mess. Any thoughts? A man's man. In what way do you think, Cody? A man's man in the sense that he's a, a man pleaser. He's a man pleaser. That's right. Yes. Ego. You know, you just said something, Erica, that I've not thought of. But, you know, it, people who are egotistical, uh, whether they're narcissists or not, they, they tend to use people, right? And I'd never thought about it, but he, he uses God in this scenario because it, as we read on here in the coming weeks, he, uh, he, he says that he's made a vow to God. I've never thought about his using God in that way, but that's exactly what has happened. All right. Huh? Okay, did you say 40? Yeah. Now, now that, that is, that's the King James text. Um, actually, the, that's, a, that's a textual problem. It's actually four years. Yeah. The, what it is, Tony, uh, the scribes, the Hebrew numbers, if they barely, if they let the pen rest wrong, it can make four turn into 40. And, and that, that's all that is. But it, it's still four years. And uh, that, that's, a long, that's a long time to, for this. Let's answer a few things on our sheets so you can keep up with them. We'll have our meeting next week. So you're going to need to keep up with these sheets for a while. Let's notice Absalom's tactics in winning over the hearts of the people Number one, he provided himself with blank and blank. What? Chariots and horses. And then how many men? 50 men. Okay. Letter B, he intercepted those coming with a what? A lawsuit or a case. You can write down either one. And he expressed what with their cases? Okay. Sympathy or agreement or favor. Any words you want to choose. I chose the word agreement with their cases. And then uh, letter C, he prevented others from doing what to the, him? Bowing. He prevented that by taking them by the hand and by what? Kissing them, okay? And, and so we, we've basically read all of that down through verse five. Mark your Bibles at verse six. That'll have us ready for question number two. And uh, put, put more thought into Absalom. Put more thought into his motives and into his actions and, uh, and what we can learn from that. Thank you. Tonight the discussion was top shelf. Thank you for all the good comments this evening.